in continuation to our symposium, it's a great pleasure to introduce to you uh, Professor Bruce Darling. He is an executive officer of the U.S. National Academy of Sciences and of the uh, oops, the National Research, Research Council. Council. Great pleasure. Please, thank you. Uh, you have the floor. Thank you. Bom dia, é um grande prazer estar aqui no Rio com vocês nesta conferência de, sobre a excelência na uh, universidades, mas tomara que me permitem falar em inglês. <laughs> so what I'd like to do today is to, um, first of all, compliment the Brazilian Academy of Sciences for focusing attention on excellence in higher education because it is a goal that most nations have, very few nations achieve, and those that do achieve it have a very difficult time building it and sustaining it. It's one of the most difficult challenges that any nation faces. What I'd like to do today is um, briefly discuss four topics. The first is the importance of excellence in higher education. The second is what I mentioned a moment ago, the difficulty in achieving and sustaining it. Third, I'd like to give you uh, two examples of factors that drive excellence. These are only two, but I'm going to focus on simply two. And then I'd like to give you two examples of universities, one public and one private, in the United States that have built excellence in very short periods of time because they may serve as models for um, not only others, other universities in the United States, but throughout the world. So let me begin by saying that um, when I was last in China, I met with the Minister of Higher Education, well, the Minister of Education and other Chinese political leaders, and um, they spoke about three goals that China had to achieve um, a, a preeminent position in the world. The first was to develop a finance system that could support industry and um, other things that uh, modern society requires. The second was a legal system that would provide fairness and equity and be understood by people from other countries doing business in China. And the third was to build excellence in its universities. And China stated very explicitly that its goal was to have two universities within the top 50 universities in the world by 2025. That is a very audacious goal. Uh, it's a goal that is uh, tremendously inspiring and it's a great aspiration, but China will have great challenge in achieving it just like all of us have great challenges in achieving it. So um, I think it's quite understandable why one would want to have excellence in universities. Universities confer tremendous intellectual, social, and economic advantages on societies and give tremendous comparative advantages to one nation over another. And so therefore, whether by intellectual interest, by nationalism, or other factors, one can understand why every nation would want to have excellent universities. I should just note some of the advantages. The first is that great universities attract great intellectual talent from throughout the world. And I would just note that by, as one example, uh, more than 25% of the members of the U.S. National Academy of Sciences, who are by and large professors at American universities, were born outside the United States. So this has obviously served uh, the United States very well, and it shows the uh, incredible talent that exists throughout the world that all of us are figuring out how to try to harness for the betterment of our societies and the betterment of the world. The second is, of course, great universities also draw outstanding students from abroad, and many of those who come to study in a university in a particular country, a large fraction of those remain in those countries either as permanent residents or sometimes as citizens of the country that they came to study in. The third is, of course, that these universities generate tremendous uh, new knowledge and tremendous innovation uh, that results in the formation of new companies, uh, whole new business sectors, 
uh, entire new economies and the creations of hundreds and hundreds of thousands of new jobs that I can point to just from the University of California alone, not to mention all the other great research universities in California or the rest of the United States. They also generate billions of dollars a year as a result in taxes for the municipalities, the state governments, and the federal government because of these companies and the employees who pay taxes that then support uh, the systems of government at all those different levels. And lastly, I would just note that the great universities are, of course, the primary drivers of upward social mobility uh, in any society, and there's good economic evidence uh, from many different societies showing that uh, universities and educational attain the higher one's educational attainment uh, on average across a society, the uh, greater social mobility will occur. Now, having said that, of course, excellence is quite difficult to achieve. There are some universities that have taken hundreds and hundreds of years to establish excellence. Harvard was not the Harvard that we know today when it was founded uh, 400, three, 400 years ago. Um, and it can often be traced to one person with an exceptional vision and a very vigorous drive to achieve excellence in the faces of many forces that try to bring excellence down to a level of homogeneity. And so it requires um, really exceptional fortitude, exceptional persistence, exceptional intellectual vision to actually achieve it. Um, there are, however, as I've said, a few counterexamples of institutions that have achieved excellence in a very short period of time, and I'll take a moment to describe a few of those. At the same time, in underscoring the difficulty, if you look at universities, even the ones we consider excellent, no, none of those universities has excellence across the board, the full range of academic disciplines, from the physical sciences to the biological sciences to the social sciences, the or that um, it won't require tremendous sacrifices by the Brazilian government, Brazilian agencies, the Brazilian people, and the leaders and faculty of the universities who truly want to achieve excellence. I would just add that having spent the majority of my life in a public research university, that in my judgment, public universities have an even greater time achieving excellence than private universities, because at least in the United States, because of their missions and their funding sources, public universities are expected to be all things to all people. They're supposed to be excellent and achieve the pinnacles of excellence. At the very same time, they're supposed to uh, admit students from all walks of life. They're supposed to achieve excellence, but to do it without spending much money. There are all these competing demands that are completely unrealistic, but yet government leaders think are sensible and therefore conspire to make it very difficult to achieve excellence. I would say that, uh, again, based on my own experience in California, a state, by the way, that has the eighth largest economy in the world, uh, is a nation state in many ways in and of itself, that all of the elected leaders expect excellence. But when you ask them to fund excellence, they have no desire to fund excellence. Um, I should tell you that the University of California is one example. When I was a student at the University of California, 60% of its annual revenue came from the state of California. Today, at the University of California, 14%, 14%, comes from the state of California. So it has dropped from 60% to 14% from the period that I was a student at the University of California to when I worked at the University. Now, at the same time, the university's budget has grown tremendously. But it's not by relying on the state of California, which has been quite generous compared to most states in the United States. Michigan does not fund the University of Michigan at the level that California does. Texas does not fund the University of Texas at the level that California does. But it is still a tremendous struggle. And then the same uh, political leaders uh, inadvertently adopt policies that conspire to achieve mediocrity while calling for excellence. So it is a tremendous challenge for a public university. Now, having said that, there are a number of many factors that drive excellence. Now, I'm 
In the interest of time, I'm only going to focus on two of them. One is government policy, and the second is an unwavering commitment to excellence on the part of the university itself. So um, in doing that, I do want to um, preface my remarks by saying that while government policy alone um, is very valuable, it in and of itself will not drive excellence, but it can help create an environment in which um, they can help facilitate and assist the building of excellence, but one also needs a drive and a commitment, an unyielding, unwavering commitment on the part of the institution itself. So how, what can a government do? Well, I'll just mention a few very obvious things, none of which are new to you, but obviously tax policies are critical. Most of our universities are tax-exempt organizations, and were it not for that, if we were taxed the way businesses are taxed or individuals were taxed, we would have a very difficult time building excellence, and the cost would be infinitely greater. The second is that our governments provide philanthropic tax benefits for philanthropists who make donations to universities. And were it not for that, uh, many of the great universities in the United States would not have uh, achieved excellence because we, even at the University of California, I'll just give you an example, a public university, $3 billion a year from the state of California, I was responsible for raising from the private sector $1.6 billion per year to help sustain the university. So it is only through the combination of business support, philanthropic support, state support, federal support, tuition and fees paid by students and parents that one can put together a budget that will really sustain excellence. And so philanthropy is important and government policy, therefore, is critical. Another example is that in the United States, uh, there's a tax policy that gives companies a research and development tax credit for investing in research, particularly at universities. So for every dollar that an American company spends on research, the U.S. government will forgive one dollar of taxation. That has driven a very positive and symbiotic relationship between uh, companies and research universities, particularly if you think back over time, when I was a young man, there were many great uh, corporate research laboratories. Bell Laboratories was a phenomenal place. Xerox Laboratories, Chevron had laboratories, IBM had laboratories. All of these have fallen by the wayside as a more uh, immediate focus on profit has driven them to reduce expenditure on research, particularly basic research, in favor of focusing their dollars on developmental aspects for developing new products. Were it not for the tax policy for R&D credits, tax credits, many companies would not be investing in universities, and yet universities have become, at least in the United States, almost the sole drivers of research for the entire nation, not only for uh, 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 universities and the government, but also for, uh, for companies. And then I would just say lastly that... Um, Another thing governments do, of course, is provide funding. Tremendous funding for uh, research, particularly for basic research, which is critical because most companies will not, do, have no incentive to invest in basic research. Uh, their incentives are to invest in something that will refine products, get products to market, which is appropriate, but there are very few companies, there are some, but very few that will invest in research. So government funding is critical because society as a whole benefits. Let me just give you one piece of data in that regard. Um, the Council, the, the Pre U.S. President's Council of Economic Advisors recently released a report which said that 50%, one half of the growth in the U.S. economy between World War II and today is a result of investments in basic research that were turned into innovations that resulted in private sector growth. Had it not been for the government investments in basic research, uh, they say the U.S. economy would be half as large as it is today. So governments have a tremendous incentive to do that to drive the economy and the, um, um, the success of their uh, citizens. They also fund undergraduate scholarships and graduate fellowships. These are critical. Many organizations do, 
the government support government support is the largest single supporter in many countries for student support and it's critical and also government can change priorities by identifying some of the most challenging issues faced by a society or by a nation and by putting funding in support of work in those areas they can drive the creativity the imagination and the innovation of faculty and students to develop solutions to these very complex problems so governments have a tremendous role they can also do something that our earlier speaker spoke about which is support independence and what do I mean by fostering or supporting independence and let me just give you a story from the University of California to underscore how critical that is uh, Daniel Coit Gilman was the third president of the University of California he came from Yale University with a vision to do something new in the United States at the time which was to create a university that was founded with equal emphasis on science and engineering and arts and humanities and social sciences. At the time, the great universities of the United States on the East Coast were all focused on the classics, but almost minimal focus on science and engineering. So he wanted to create an institution that was excellent across the board, and he sought to do so. But he encountered tremendous resistance from within the state of California. Uh, for example, agricultural interests wanted the University of California, which was only by then 10 years old, to be a farm school where students would work in the fields by day. And when he did, he not only built the great institutions at Hopkins, much on the model that he sought for the University of California, but when he left, he wrote a public letter to the people of California saying, California will one day be a great state and California could have a great university, but it will never have a great university if it does not achieve independence and autonomy from the state government. And coincidentally, at that very time, there was a constitutional convention taking place in California, the Constitutional Convention of 1879, and these same forces were at war within the Constitutional Convention. The Constitutional Convention dragged on for over a year, the spring arrived, the farmers, of course, had to return to their farms to plant their crops, and so as they left, the business interests from San Francisco swept in, called for a vote, achieved autonomy for the University of California, and by, by taking language out of the Constitution of the state of Michigan, inserted it into the Constitution of California. The people of California ratified this Constitution, and the result is that the University of California is now a fourth branch of government, co-equal with the executive branch, the legislative branch, the judicial branch. Uh, the regents of the University of California are a private corporation created by the state. They decide whether or not they should follow the laws of the state of California. They own all the assets of the University of California physically, all the buildings, all the, all the faculty, staff, and others are employees of the... So it operates like a corporation, but because of that, the seeds were planted for the building of excellence at the University of California, and it never would have happened if it were not for Daniel Coit Gilman's decision to leave and to um, write his letter to the people of California expressing his vision and what California could or could not achieve, depending on whether it wished to or did not wish to grant independence. So. Um, the other thing I would just mention that the government can do is it can have tremendous vision, vision for society and vision for its academic community, and I'd like to give you an example of this. Uh, during the Second World War, there were two very eminent academicians who served as science advisors to Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who was then president of the United States. One was Vannevar Bush, who had been a longtime vice president an electrical engineer at MIT, but who was then president of the Carnegie Institute of Science in Washington, D.C., and James Conant, a very eminent chemist who was then president of Harvard. Um, at the time, they, together with the U.S. National Academy of Sciences, managed to convince President Roosevelt that in an international war like World War I, one needed to mobilize the entire scientific, engineering, and medical community behind the war effort if one were to expect to have success. Um, 
they made this case to Roosevelt. Roosevelt agreed. But then the government's solution was to hire all these scientists, engineers, and physicians as government employees, move them to Washington, D.C. as civil servants, and set up research laboratories in Washington to serve the needs of the U.S. government and the military in the execution of the war. But Bush and Conant had a very different idea, and they fought long and hard and finally were successful in saying, no, that's the wrong idea. If you bring people to Washington, the political norms of Washington will be the standards of excellence for the, these researchers, and we will never achieve excellence. Rather, we should leave the faculty at their universities where they've shown the ability to be creative, innovative, and successful, and the government should instead turn to a different model, which is to use contracts and grants to fund research with federal funds at these universities. And so that is the model that began during the Second World War and became the dominant model after the war with the creation of the National Science Foundation, the National Institutes of Health, and everything else. And, and it was, I think, one of the most brilliant and ingenious strokes by government uh, in the United States throughout its entire history. And what it did was it set, again, the conditions for excellence in the university with the government being a partner but a partner that would not meddle to the degree that Daniel Coyle Gilman faced with meddling from the legislature in California. The result was, of course, that if you think about the three great technological achievements that helped win World War II, they were radar, which was located at MIT, largely started by uh, E.O. Lawrence, who was then at Berkeley, who was offered the opportunity to lead the radar effort, but declined to focus on atomic research but he recruited everybody to go to MIT to create radar. Radar had a decisive effect on the Battle of Britain. Uh, second was the amphibious landings that occurred in North Africa, in Europe, and the Pacific, all took place with government funding at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography, which is now part of the University of California, San Diego, where Walter Monk, many allied scientists from throughout the world learned about ocean currents, meteorology, nearshore wave action, all the decisive factors in amphibious landings. And then finally, the atomic bomb, which was contracted with the University of California, where Robert Oppenheimer uh, led the effort at Los Alamos National Laboratory. So um, with that in mind, um, let me turn then to the, the role of universities themselves in creating excellence. Um, and what I would say is, it requires, just to reemphasize what I said earlier, a tremendous focus on excellence. And what I'd like to do is to give you examples of two universities that have achieved it in a very short period of time. The first is Stanford University, a private university, that was not that long ago a not very good university. Uh, it's hard for us to believe today, but that is really the truth through the 1940s. And the second is, so that's taking a regional quality university and converting it to a world-class University. I'll give you a few examples of that. And then the second is the University of California, San Diego, a public university that was created in 1960, and by 1980, 20 years later, had achieved international levels of excellence uh, that is almost unheard of, and has become a model for m many uh, governments around the world to try to figure out how to emulate. As a matter of fact, the government of Singapore, when I was at UC San Diego, set a team every year for 10 years to study the rise of UC San Diego to try to figure out how Singapore could replicate that uh, rise. So with that, let me just give you, uh, describe a little bit about them. One cannot do justice to uh, how it was achieved, so I'll only focus on a couple of quick points. Um, Stanford, as I said, was a good regional university, but it wasn't, and it had a few, um, uh, areas of excellence, but it really wasn't the Stanford we know today until Fred Terman. Fred Terman was the son of a Stanford faculty member. Uh, his father was a professor of psychology uh, who developed the first uh, IQ test, the Stan not the first, the, was the Frenchman Binet was the first one to do the uh, IQ test, but he developed the Stanford Binet IQ test, which is the one that's been used most uniformly around the world building on the work of his uh, French colleague, Binet. 
Uh, his son, Fred Terman, was a professor of electrical engineering, became dean of engineering, and had a novel view of the role of the university. It wasn't just to build excellence, but also to spread excellence. And so he, as many of you know, of course, is known as the father of Silicon Valley, because two of his students, Bill Hewlett and David Packard, were planning to go on to get PhDs, and Fred Terman dissuaded them from doing so and said, no, go out and create a great company. You have the ability to do so. That company became Hewlett Packard. Hewlett Packard became the anchor for what we know uh, as Silicon Valley today, and Fred continued to send many of his students out to create these companies. But he also was focused on building excellence in the university. Now, how did he do it? Well, there were many ways. Um, someone that I used to work for was one of the people that he recruited to help him do this. But one of his novel ways was he would look every year when the U.S. National Academy of Science and the U.S. National Academy of Engineering would uh, make elections of new members, he would look at the people who just missed being elected. They were just below the cutoff point. So one could expect that with continued good work on their part, they would probably be elected to the academy the next year or in five years or so forth. And he would go out and he would target them at every university around the country, and then he would recruit them to Stanford. They were recruited when they had good reputations, but not yet great reputations. <laughs> so they were very thankful to Stanford for recruiting them. And then in a year or two or three, when they were elected to the National Academy, they felt tremendous debt of uh, loyalty and honor to Terman and to Stanford for having uh, helped them in their careers. He did many other things as well, but I'll just uh, cite that as one. Another thing he did was, perhaps because of his father's background in psychology, he had brought broad intellectual interests, and he was one of the first people to really drive the um, use of mathematics in the social sciences. So many of the fields we know today, cognitive science, other fields, uh, uh, economics, uh, quantitative uh, econometrics, and other fields like this, uh, received tremendous support from uh, Terman, who helped Stanford build not only excellence in science and engineering, but also in the social sciences. And it brought people together in interdisciplinary ways. So the person that I worked for, who was president of the University of California, was Richard Atkinson, who I'll mention a bit later. He was a mathematician as an undergraduate but in graduate school decided to apply mathematics to biological systems. And he was interested in the human brain. He developed the first mathematical model for how the brain operates, short-term memory, long-term memory, input-output processes, and so forth. It's still 45 years later, the modal model for the human brain, and no one has achieved a better model. And so he, Atkinson helped Terman build this, this excellence and Stanford Atkinson and uh, Pat Soupies and others then created the first interactive computer system, and it just kept building and building and building. Engineers, psychologists, mathematicians working together. So having said that, let me just turn briefly then to um, the University of California, San Diego, and say that, uh, but before I do, I should say that the University of California, San Francisco, which many people know as a great biological medical institution, was very similar to Stanford. It was an average regional university until there was a faculty revolt in the late 1950s, early 1960s, where they said, you know, you, the administration, do not have a focus on excellence. This will never be a great institution. And so they recruited Holly Smith from Harvard and Smith came and led a strong faculty-led drive, not a president's drive, but a faculty-led drive to build excellence there. And it was really through those efforts that uh, UCSF has risen to the pinnacle of biomedical research uh, universities. So turning to UC San Diego, uh, let me just say, I said earlier, 1960 it was founded. I, of course, grew out of the Scripps Institution of Oceanography and Roger Revelle, who was the founder of UCSD, had been the director of Scripps, but Scripps, even at the time, was not a phenomenal oceanographic institution. It was basic, oceanography was based on the coasts. It had never reached out to the great oceans, and Roger had a vision coming out of World War II, which was that oceanography needed to be built on physics, chemistry, and biology, and it needed to send expeditions throughout the great oceans of the world, and as a result, develop new knowledge of how 
the oceans work, how the oceans drive uh, weather and climate and so forth, and really is the father of climate change, global warming, and many of the fields we know today. It was Roger who recruited Charles David Keeling, who uh, developed 50 years of measurements of CO2, uh, is, is really the primary experimental evidence for global warming today. So Roger's vision was unique. Roger's vision was, his vision for a university was like a European cathedral, but he said you don't build a cathedral from the foundation up, you build an intellectual cathedral from the steeple down. Now what did he mean by that? He meant you start first by hiring the very best faculty in the world, you bring them to the university, you give them three or four years to get their research programs underway without any students involved whatsoever. Uh, you allow them slowly to start recruiting graduate students and create graduate programs, and only after you have PhD programs of the, of the highest quality do you then begin to create undergraduate programs for college students. So this was a very novel approach to uh, higher education. And uh, I would say that when I arrived in 1980, 20 years later, uh, UCSD had, on a per capita basis, it was second only to Caltech in the number of National Academy of Science members on its faculty. So in 20 years, it had risen to number two in the United States on a per capita basis. It was number five in federal research funding. In 20 years, it had risen ahead of most of the great universities in the United States, public and private. It had six Nobel laureates on its faculty. It had two Fields Prize winners in mathematics, Xing Tung Yao and Michael Friedman, who Jacob, you know. And so this is just almost unheard of. As a matter of fact, the publisher of the Washington Post, Catherine Graham, called it Atkinson's Miracle because no institution had ever achieved excellence in such a short period of time anywhere in the world. By 1994, 14 years later, when the National Academy of Sciences came out with its ranking of graduate programs, um, Berkeley was number one. There were eight private universities, and UC San Diego was number 10. In the top 10, there were only two public universities, Berkeley and San Diego, both parts of the University of California. One, 130 years old, Berkeley. Another one, San Diego, 30 years old. So. They did a tremendous job, but how did Roger do it? So Roger's notion was build first, very small. You start with only three departments, physics, chemistry, and biology, and you recruit the most eminent leaders in the field. So in chemistry, who did he hire to become department chairman? Harold Urey, the Nobel laureate for discovering, was it U-238? I don't remember. Anyway, one of the uh, substances. Um, in biology, he recruited David Bonner from Yale, whose sole focus was on cellular and molecular biology. No other area of bi biology would UCSD engage in at the very beginning. In physics, the focus was solely on condensed matter physics and astronomy and astrophysics. And so, and then in mathematics, they recruited people like Helmut Brühl from Germany. But in physics, they recruited, uh, one of my favorite example is Maria Gepard Mayer. Maria had never had a faculty position anywhere. She trailed her husband, Joe, who was a chemist, from Hopkins to Harvard to Chicago, and finally they came to UC San Diego where she received her first faculty appointment, her first paid salaried faculty position. In 1960, she won the Nobel Prize in physics. She was a theoretical physicist, so she could work without uh, great expensive apparatus. And to show you how San Diego perceived these things at the time, the headline of the local newspaper said, La Jolla Housewife Wins Nobel <laughs> Prize. <laughs> so you can see that San Diego didn't quite understand this. <laughs> uh, David Bonner's whole notion was, first you build cellular molecular biology, and then you take your school of medicine, which was then nascent and just building, and instead of having a faculty in the School of Medicine teach the basic sciences, you have the faculty in biology, chemistry, and physics teach the medical students. 
So we had the highest standards. The result was that after the second year of medical school in the United States, there are national board exams where all students must be tested on their knowledge of the basic sciences. The first year the UCSD student, medical students took the exam, they were number one in the United States. The second year they were number one in the United States. The third year they were number one in the United States. Then all the other universities put pressure on the medical testing board to stop announcing the results publicly because <laughs> they didn't like uh, having this young upstart university having students always be number one. So um, having said that, let me just note that um, it was only after you built excellence in these sub-disciplines, condensed matter physics and astrophysics, that then you would even have the temerity to expand into high energy physics or other areas of physics. And the same in chemistry, and the same in biology. The result was UCSD achieved international excellence in very narrow areas, but those set the standards for the rest of the institution in every department of science, in every sub-discipline, those became the standards, so no one recruited anybody who, to those new sub-disciplines that did not measure up to the people who were already on the faculty in the initial sub-disciplines. And then that same approach was carried into engineering, social sciences, arts, and humanities. And so, as, as I said, a, a very unique vision on the part of Roger, who was a good friend of mine and who passed away not too many years ago, and uh, as I said, the results speak for themselves. Six Nobel Prize winners, 50 members of the National Academy of Sciences, two Fields Medalists, Pulitzer Prize Medalists, all within 34 years of the admission, well, actually the hiring of the first faculty and well before the uh, um, uh, enrollment of students. So then when Richard Atkinson became chancellor of UCSD in 1980, he had spent his uh, early years at Stanford working with Terman and building excellence. So he brought the Stanford model, a private university model, to a public university and uh, applied the same standards of excellence but with a very difficult challenge. UCSD had 10,000 students in 1980. It was ordered to grow to 30,000 students within uh, 20 years because California demographics demanded that the University of California and all universities in California grow dramatically. And so the most amazing thing is that in that period of time, UCSD grew from 10,000 students to 30,000 students. And most people said, including many of the faculty, you cannot do that without degrading the quality and achieving mediocrity at the same time because you can't possibly hire that many faculty in that short a period of time and maintain your standards of excellence. But at the end of that period of time, UCSD's quality had only increased further and it was an even stronger university at the end of that period of time. Each one of those faculty appointments that came with the growth in student enrollment was used to build even greater strength and greater excellence in all of those disciplines. So with that, let me just conclude by saying that um, you know, there's a lot more that I could say about building excellence. Uh, it's a very difficult thing to do. There are many practices at the University of California, just as one institution where the regents, are the governance body of the university, the president, the 10 chancellors, but most importantly, the faculty practice on a daily basis to achieve excellence. Uh, but we really don't have time to talk about that. I would just note that um, Although the University of California is public, I mentioned earlier that philanthropy has been critical. We could not have built many of the programs we did, hired the quality of faculty that we did without the ability to have state fund the salary, private philanthropy, endow professorships, and give the professor unrestricted resources to spend on his or her research to, to recruit the best graduate students and so forth. And also, uh, our ties with business were critical. San Diego at the time that I arrived in 1980 was a, a former Navy town. Um, it was really not a vibrant economy. It was moribund. It was sort of on a decline after World War II as the war wound down. The fact the community was very conservative and many of the people were concerned that the university was hiring communists on its faculty and this was, this was a, you know, tremendous sort of sense of uh, 
source of tension. But over that period of time, Atkinson, using the Stanford model, encouraged many students, many faculty to go out and form companies. And the result was that, Stan that uh, San Diego's economy has just risen dramatically in, in uh, wireless communication. So Erwin Jacobs, who founded Qualcomm, and Erwin is now a billionaire. I remember Erwin when he was an assistant professor at UCSD. But he and another colleague created one of the most advanced technologies for wireless communications that's used throughout the world. There are many other examples in software and biotechnology and so forth. Those people then owe debts of gratitude to the university, and they invested heavily through their companies and through their own philanthropy of building up. Thank you very much. California has three tiers of higher education. The real emphasis on teaching, and then the University of California is the research institution. There are 10 campuses, and um, there may be uh, 120,000 students at those 10 campuses. The University of California, after World War I, was under tremendous pressure to expand its student body and become a university like in many other states, like Wisconsin or Michigan, which is sort of the combination of all of those three types of institutions. The University of California um, resisted doing so, and so Professor Lang, who was a professor of education at Berkeley, came up with a novel idea, which is, how do we help California meet the needs for higher education while having the university focus on its research excellence? So he created the community college system. He convinced the governor to create it as a separate entity to meet the demand for large-scale enrollment but continue to allow the university to focus on excellence. Similarly, when the California, when California after World War II grew, many, um, the California State University system was teachers' colleges, normal schools, and the University of California urged the governor to build those up to take care of much of the teaching load for undergraduates, so again, the university could be maintain its focus on research, doctoral education, but also on undergraduate education, but with a different focus on excellence, and thereby meet the, whole, the needs of the whole state. So they work together very well. They're articulated very carefully. A student can move from any one of those institutions to another, and they have curricula, and um, academic standards that are interleaved in a very positive way. Uh, Professor Cunha, um, first uh, I should tell you my daughter is studying in Santiago right now at uh, La Chile, and we just visited her last month in Santiago, so it's a pleasure to see you here. Um, yes, when I was an undergraduate student at the University of California, tuition and fees were uh, $300 per year. I think I'm paying for my daughter, who's now a third-year student, about $30,000 per year. So it's changed dramatically in the past 40-some years, um, and that's largely because the state of California has disinvest, made a conscious policy decision to disinvest in higher education. 
what they have discovered through polling and many other things the politicians have discovered that a parent will do almost anything to send a child to college, even if they have to mortgage their house, even if they have to go into debt. And so what they've done is they've pulled money away from higher education to invest in other social programs in the state of California and forced the university and the other universities to raise fees. So on average, we receive, the University of California receives about 13% of its funding from tuition, no, sorry, it's now, the amount of money from tuition now exceeds the amount of money from the state of California. And finally, are the students committed to excellence? I would say yes. And I think that's one of the things that um, keeps the faculty there is the faculty sets very high standards. The students who come to the University of California come because they care about excellence and they, they um, go to great lengths to try to get into the University of California because of that, because they know what it means for future graduate education, for careers, and other types of things. Thank you. I'm on the group of... Uh, well, just one minute. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you for bringing hope for us because uh, our top university in Brazil, they have more than 30,000 students and have, well, but Busby has more than 60 or 70 and so, so on. Uh, so I want to touch on a very delicate question here in Brazil that, uh, 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 as you mentioned, uh, I didn't know that uh, so the University of California system is like uh, the fourth power to the state. Right, as autonomy, uh, but how do you choose your presidents and uh, uh, well, the deans, etc.? But I, I, I know a little bit, but I contrast that with our tradition in Brazil. My <laughs> ministry is looking to me uh, that uh, here we choose by uh, elections that are uh, done by faculty and staff and students. So. Uh, because of course, to take these decisions that we, uh, I think the example uh, you see in San Diego was very, was very great because in a very short period of time we, we, we had this fantastic value. So we, we think that we have to change something in the next years. Uh, and so I would like to ask you how you do that and if you change that in looking at the, what, what was the story of the value. Thank you for this very nice presentation. Is it working? Yes. yes. Okay. A uh, simple question. Uh, when you said that uh, Alexander was a uh, forefather of the University of California, attracted people, how flexible are they in offering wages, different wages? How is the wage policy uh, it impacted? It impacted? <coughs> okay. Uh, Just short question. Uh, I understand that endowment is a very important part of the overall budget. Now, how much money does industry apply in research in the UC system? Because my numbers say that apart from one or two, the percentage of industrial money invested in research at the university is rather small. Good. Um, so I, in answer to the first question, uh, the university does not elect its leadership at any, at any level. Um, that is a very, um, that would be a very um, strange concept to us. Um, the faculty have a strong role but the way it is done, the president of the University of California, there's one president of the entire University of California. Uh, he or she is selected by the regents of the University of California through a search process that involves faculty uh, leaders. As, there's a search committee that's put together. It includes several regents, uh, another chancellor or two of one of the campuses, a number of distinguished faculty, and includes a student or two. They go out and try to identify people and ultimately hire them. Uh, there is no government invo involvement. The governor does not interview the candidates, and so forth. For each of the then 10 chancellors of each of the universities, Berkeley, Los Angeles, San Diego, 
Those are each selected by the president of the University of California. Um, the current president uh, is Janet Napolitano. She would have a search committee that would include um, several regents, um, perhaps another chancellor, the president of the university, um, some students and faculty, and then the president would appoint that individual. At the dean level, then the chancellor would do something similar on the campus to appoint deans in various areas. Um, Sandoval, your question about uh, salary policy. The university has a um, salary structure that's very wide and very um, flexible. So I'll give you one example. Mike Friedman was a very good friend of mine. Mike was an assistant professor at UCSD when I first met him. Um, he solved the Poincaré conjecture in three dimensions, four dimensions, I think it was, and suddenly four, yeah, and then suddenly became, um, uh, spent a year traveling the world talking to other mathematicians who tested whether the various branches of mathematics that he brought together to solve the problem were indeed uh, correct. But he went from an assistant professor salary to the highest salary of any faculty member on the UCSD campus in one year. And he's paid the university back in many, in many years. He's now left to go to Microsoft and he's now at UC Santa Barbara. But So the policy is flexible. It's based on excellence. And so excellence is what drives. And similarly, if you do not perform as a faculty member, um, your, salary, your salary will never increase, ever. Not for inflation, not for any other purpose. All salaries at the University of California are solely based on merit. There's no uh, inflationary salary increase for staff or faculty. And so if you don't deliver, no salary increase. And if you don't deliver, then you leave. So it's very, uh, very yes, serious. You have to clarify about financial form. Four, yes, thank you. Three was a famous case of the Russians and so on. That was the origin of privacy. Well, Karen, they declined. That's right. So the salary, no, the salary scale is the same at every University of California campus. But um, you will find that in those campuses that have greater levels of excellence, let me take Berkeley, which is sort of the paragon of excellence in the University of California, you'll find many more faculty at the very tops of the salary levels. And in other universities that don't have as many uh, as much excellence, you'll find the salary levels on average being lower. And then finally, endowment. Um, endowment is critical, but companies do businesses do not contribute to endowment. Uh, businesses typically do not contribute to funding buildings; they're exceptions, and not to endowment. Endowment typically comes from individuals, wealthy individuals contributing money. And uh, how, what is the percentage of research funding, I should say funding from industry? I don't have a number or percentage off the top of my head, but I would say um, it's substantial, but it's not as high as you might expect. It, it's probably less than 20%, maybe between 10 and 20%, something like that. Okay. Um. More questions. There will be uh, at most one group of three questions because uh, we are on time. No questions? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you.